Just give me a little bit of peace. Yeah. Steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace. Yeah. Steady job and some food to eat. Just Chapter 4. Part 2. Profiles. Trey Dog. Short golden brown complexion. All time most favored neighborhood crip. Always dressed in crip wear. Trey Dog wore khaki suits, Godfather hats, and Stacy Adams shoes as though he invented gang wear. Established reputation for being a skilled fighter, very strong pride and concern for the NH Crips, strong influence amongst the homeboys and considered a threat by rival gangs. Labeled a role model, Crip by many. Yet, he himself looked up to Donnie Ramsey greatly, personally telling me how much he strived to be like him. Although Trey Dog might be considered hardcore by many, I know that he had a good heart and was morally conscious. We were incarcerated together in the California Youth Authority as teens, and he shared his personal views with me about things. Tie stick. Tall, brown, complexioned, and slightly on the slim side in his younger years. A hit with the girls. Unbounding pride and dedication for the neighborhood crips. Well-dressed in gang wear. Very devious around other gangs. Stubborn when it comes to having his way. Very effective at leading fellow gang members into action. Impacting leadership abilities, but most commonly amongst the younger as opposed to his peers. Al Capone Smith. Short boyish features and charm. Quiet, soft-spoken, and observant. Innocent smile, yet dangerous on his flip side toward other gangs. Gun carrier and user. Bake Nut Baker. Tall, slim to medium build, dark complexioned, strong Ethiopian type facial bone structure and well physically defined. Neighborhood Crip spokesperson. Disliked confusion and disorder to the point that he may interrupt escalating chaos to organize fights or break them up altogether. Sometimes ending up fighting the most vocal and aggressive person himself. In his later years, I would describe him as a devout peacemaker with less concern for gang activities than in his early years. Salt Rock Giles. Medium height, brown complexion, slightly chubby, always in crip wear, strong neighborhood pride, aggressive, humorous, big smile, and can clown you for days. Turned off by passive homeboys who can't hold their own. Sometimes caught in thought that makes you wonder what he's thinking. Private inner side. Marvin Lil Rock Miller. Tall, light brown complexioned, big guy, muscular, quick to fight, and physically feared by most. Well known in the gang world. Strong, self-confident, wise, yet often ruthless and self-centered. A neighborhood Crip gang co-founder and known threat to other gangs. Has directly pulled rank on everyone at one time or another. But you gotta love him. Donnie Eight Ball Ramsey. Neighborhood Crip gang founder after moving to San Diego from Los Angeles. Vocal. Intimidating. Arguably the most muscular gang member in San Diego said to have reached 23 inch biceps. Giving the title Mr. Soledad while serving time in Soledad prison due to muscularity. All time most popular, yet less active as the neighborhood Crips became more known. The Five Nine Brims, 1975. In September, the regular school semester began at Gompers and I immediately was able to identify the Brims. The Brims didn't spell their name out alphabetically, but used numbers instead, 5-9. I noticed that most of the Brims wore coolie hats. These coolie hats were named after the hat that Lawrence Hilton Jacobs wore in the 1975 movie Coolie High. Fashion-wise, I had been picturing them differently because earlier I had met a family from Long Beach who told me that they were all members of a gang called the Long Beach Ace Deucey Brims. 
They showed me their hand signs and how they wore brim hats with the red ace and two of hearts poker card in the lining. This is what I expected to see the brims doing. At school, I would overhear the brims calling each other by nicknames. I heard names like Spanky, Frank Nitty, T-Top, Richard, and Omar. Richard and Omar appear, appear to be the most influential. I recall how the brims would walk to a gas station after school by Lincoln High. They would meet this short guy who wore big mirror sunglasses and a coolie hat. He wore the hat atop long braids and would be leaning on a walking cane for the sake of being cool. They called him Sir Prince. Sir Prince was to the Brims what Trey Dog was to the neighborhood Crips. Very well favored by his homeboys. Altercations. The Crips and Brims managed to get along at Gompers for the most part. However, I do recall two altercations that took place. One involved me. It was my first gang-related incident. One afternoon on campus, I was walking to my PE class when I observed Brims, Richard, and Omar. They were staring fiercely at me. This was considered a challenge called mad dogging, so I returned their glares equally. They both then held up the Brim gang sign, in which is considered a challenge. I then held up four fingers and declared, Neighborhood! As I continued walking, I could hear them uttering insults about the Crips under their breath. Apparently, they had observed me hanging out with them a few times. I got really offended by this because I felt that they were singling me out as a weak link, so I decided to teach them a lesson about challenging me. I walked off campus to Gompers Park, which connects to the school by the gate. About 10 of the NH Crips were kicking back on the grass watching me as I angrily approached. What's up, Crazy Kurt? Salt Rock asked. Man, those brims are talking shit. I responded in disbelief. They were throwing up the brim sign on me and talking shit about NH. I added. What? Who the fuck was it? Salt Rock asked as everyone came to their feet. It was those two fools, Richard and Omar, I said, jerking my hands in the air. I held up the four and claimed NH on them, cuz. Fuck that, Salt Rock included. Richard been thinking he's tough lately because of all the brims he's been looking up to him. But they on our turf. They can't talk shit in the hood. Come on, everybody, let's go. We all walked back to campus with Salt Rock and I leading the pack. None of us said a word to each other. We were all looking mad and focused intently on kicking some ass. The brim's ass. When we arrived on campus, the bells had just rung everyone back to class. We spotted Richard and Omar immediately. Apparently, they had spotted us also because I could see them nervously conferring with each other as we were closing in on them. Some of us had started yelling, NH. Finally, they turned up to face us. Hold up, you guys, Salt Rock instructed us as we anxiously began to put on our gloves. We ain't gonna jump them. I want to throw down with these fools, head up, one-on-one. -on -one. Salt Rock then confronted Richard. What's up with you and my homeboy, Crazy Kirk? You want to shoot heads with me instead? Salt Rock asked Richard as he nosed up and walked circles around him. Omar attempted to intervene, but a few of us quickly stepped in, indicating for him to back off. By this time, a large crowd had gathered to watch. Most of them had followed us when we came on campus. They knew we were Crips going after someone, so they followed us to see the action. But before anything kicked off, we were interrupted. Suddenly, from the back of the crowd came, Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams was a counselor at Gompers. He was a black man who stood a good six feet five inches tall, and he always meant business. Okay, what's going on here? Break it up. Break it up right now, he demanded. The ones of you who go here, get to class. If you don't go here, you best get off my campus, and I mean now. Turning to the brims, Mr. Williams instructed, Get back to class, Richard and Omar. Now. 
Eventually, we all broke it up and went our separate ways. But sometime before the school day was over, one of the Brims made a phone call to inform his homeboys about the confrontation with us. This became clear as after school, there was a large showing of Brims who had came from across town to support their gang. Yet most of the neighborhood Crips were not there to respond. They had all gone to hang out at 4-5 Park. 4-5 Park was located on 45th and Logan Avenue. At that time, there were no other gangs staking claim to that park, so the neighborhood Crips used it as an optional hangout for several homeboys who lived in, the, in around the area. Ty Sticks, Salt Rock, my cousin EO, Lil Rock, and more. The incident with the Brims took place on a Friday, but by Monday, everything went back to normal. However, as a result of this incident, my name and face became known to the Brims. Other Brim names I heard and met at the time were names such as Bo, the Simmons Brothers, Pitbull, Sir Lunchalot, the Blankenships, Hardy, Big Country, and Monster. Ocean View Park. The Five Nine Brims stake claim to two parks, South Crest and Ocean View. These two parks were in their gang territory just blocks from one another. Ocean View was more popular with the community, while South Crest was more private to the Brims. In the late 1970s, early 1980s, the Brims occupied South Crest more for their gatherings, but now opt for Ocean View. During the entire 1970s, Ocean View Park was a popular community gathering spot on Sundays. There were live local bands, beer, marijuana, barbecues, and lots of socializing. Black people came from all over San Diego to attend. It would start in the early afternoon and end just before dark. There were many motorcycle clubs who attended in large numbers. They hung out in club groups at the back of the crowd. The largest were the Cobras, followed by the Black Sabbath, the Voodoo Kings, and the Four Horsemen motorcycle clubs. The motorcycle clubs had a potential for violence, but the street gangs were the biggest threat. All the street gangs would hold ground in choice positions in the park. They would be checking each other out and waiting for the bands to call out the last song performance before confronting rivals on unsettled disputes or new challenges. They didn't always wait, but at times they did as a courtesy after people complained that the gangs were causing disturbances and forcing the day's activities to end prematurely. The gangs referred to this as turning it out. To turn something out is to cause an social, any social event to end due to disruptive behavior or incident. Ocean View Park was a catch on title given by citizens of the community, but not by the city of San Diego. On a city map, the park as well as the Brim's surrounding territory is called Mountain View. The title Ocean View results from the popular street Ocean View Boulevard that the park is on. Paul Lowe's Control, 1977. Paul Lowe's Control was a gang named after a liquor store that was owned by a retired San Diego Chargers running back. Paul Lowe's Liquor was located in the Lincoln Park section of Southeast San Diego. The Lincoln Park boys titled themselves after the store's name, adding the word control to emphasize the strictness of their territory. Despite the strict sound of their gang title, they played host to other gangs who frequented this location to buy weed and PCP, the choice drug at the time. They also had the popular Minifields Records right next door, as well as the famous Proud Bird Chicken across the street that attracted many outsiders. Unlike the other gangs, Lincoln Park were generally creatures of habitat who seldom ventured outside their territories. This was likely because Paul Lowell's was such a frequented spot by other gangs, they basically stayed on their home turf to hold it down. Weekend house parties were common sites for local gangs, but less attended by PLC until they became more active in 1980. Ultimately, Paul Lowell's control became a well-known and established blood gang, renamed the Lincoln Park Piru, after officially proclaiming themselves bloods in 1980, they became a force to be reckoned with. They end up being a large gang with a strong financial base and muscle. 
They established a peace treaty with the new Skyline Piru, who formed the previous year in 1979 as a new generation replacement of the East Side Hanging Gang located in the Skyline District. Years later, this truce will be broken, broken, leading to a tense and ongoing rivalry between the two. In the mid-1980s, the Lincoln Park Piru established a crime faction called the Sindo Mob, short for Syndicate. The Sindo Mob increased their power from the capital of crack cocaine sales and attracted new recruits at an amazingly fast pace. As a result of their mounting popularity, the Sindo became arrogant and started playing hardball with other street gangs and law enforcement. They began they became involved in a full-scale war with the known Los Angeles-based Crip gang who moved in on their territory unannounced to sell crack. In this war, the alleged financial kingpin of the Sindo mob lost his brother. During this ongoing rivalry, a San Diego police officer was killed in January of 1988. It was said that two police officers stumbled upon members of the Lincoln Park Piru who were armed and on their way to retaliate against the Los Angeles Crips. Most convictions resulted from this and the Lincoln Park Sindo stronghold was eventually toppled. Today, the Lincoln Park Bloods are still a large gang, but the glitter and limelight has diminished considerably. The original Sindo gang established by the OGs had reached near organization status. However, the new generation is clearly back down to street gang level. The original Sindo mob was first established as a powerful financial base. They operated to maintain financial dominance over other gangs. However, aggressive sting operations led by law enforcement to dismantle black gangs thwarted their goals. Namely, with indictments such as Operation Blue Rag, Spring of 1990, Operation Red Rag, Fall of 1990, and then Operation Rainbow. At day's end, the Lincoln Park Piru left a very historical mark in the gang world. Skyline Piru. Skyline is what I would consider to be the last black community farthest east of Southeast San Diego. It sits on the opposite side of Imperial Avenue where I grew up at in Encanto. It was a large community with two story homes, green lawns and a nice car parked in the driveway. When I was a kid, I believed that the Skyline area was for, was for the wealthy blacks. It didn't appear to be the type of area where they would encounter gangs. This was in the early to mid 1970s. Skyline Drive is a major thoroughfare for the area. On it sits four different grade schools, Valencia Park Elementary, O'Farrell Junior High, Fulton Elementary, and Morris High. When I first started skipping classes at O'Farrell, I ventured up to Morse with a friend named Ricky. Morse High had a small lawn out front where groups of students would, ensom would ensemble and socialize. They would be kicking back on the grass. Some of them were members of the West Coast Wrecking Crew Crips and the East Side Hanging Gang Crips, a skyline group who were not Crips. The two groups chatted with each other on occasion and there appeared to be no serious rivalry. One of my older brothers went to Morse High and claimed West Coast Wrecking Crew at the time. The West Coast Crips wore blue bandanas in their pocket, but the hanging gang symbol was a hangman's noose. I witnessed a guy twirling one around in his hand. I don't recall seeing what their bandana color was or if they wore one at all. They were slightly before my time and had begun to phase out by the onset of my gang involvement in 1977. However, in 1979, a new gang emerged from the Skyline area. They called themselves the Skyline Piru Blood Gang. I don't know if any of them were past members of the East Side Hanging Gang because they all appeared to be my age or younger. Since the Hanging Gang was before my time, I assumed it was before theirs as well. Nevertheless, they still held on to the east side as their geographic location. My first encounter with the Skyline Piru was in 1979 at a house in Encanto that some of the girls from our gang were hosting. There were three sisters and their parents never seemed to be at home, so we would hang out there very often. It was just a few blocks from my house, so it was cool because now I never had to go far to get home after the night was over. 
My homegirls were charging a dollar at the door to get in the party, but the neighborhood crips were admitted for free. Later that night, about 20 guys showed up at the door wearing red and black bandanas. They were contesting the dollar fee, but Bake Nut made it clear to them that they would have to pay to enter. Eventually, they did pay, but after a couple dances, they left, making a failed attempt to snatch the money back that was being collected at the door. Instead of grabbing the money, it fell from the hat that it was being collected in and onto the ground. They pulled off in the station wagons, but returned when the party was ending with the same number of guys. Most of the neighborhood crips had went back to the turf, but around eight of us stayed. We were waiting for another ride because someone had ripped me off for the stolen Lincoln Town car that I had parked outside. I was going to use it to drive my homeboys back across town and then take myself home. It was me, Bake Nut, Kenwood, Al Capone, Woodlock, Crazy J, and Brando. When we saw that the group of unidentified guys in red had showed up again, we stopped outside to confront them, and their spokesperson greeted us. What's up, you guys? My name is Rick. They call me Hitman, he said. He's already off to a bad start, I thought to myself. We already had a homeboy named Hitman, and most gangs don't like sharing names with rivals. We just came back to let you guys know that we didn't come for trouble earlier. We just didn't think it was cool to be charging us a dollar, but none of you guys had to pay, Hitman pointed out. We ain't supposed to pay, exclaimed Bake Nut. This is a neighborhood Crips party. How we look paying to get in our own set, he asked in disbelief. Where are you guys from anyway, cuz? Bake Nut curiously asked. He then continued before allowing an answer. Y'all flagging red flags, but ain't none of y'all brims? We know all the brims, Bake Nut said, as the rest of us glared at attention. We from Skyline. Hitman responded, and we Piru, he quickly added. Cuz ain't no Piru in Diego, I argued, stepping forward. There is now, said Hitman, turning to his homeboys, who all began to nod in agreement. We skyline Piru, east side, he quickly added. Hell nah, wait a minute, Bake Nut cut in. There's only one east side, and that's the east side neighborhood rolling 40s Crips. Yeah, but we east side too, Hitman argued. Rolling 80s, he added. Rolling 80s, I laughed, looking at my homeboys in disbelief. And plus, you guys got on black rags, I pointed out. Black is a crip rag, cuz, I informed him. I had a black rag on a few days ago. Well, if you wear one right now, you might get mistaken for one of us because we flagging them tough, Hitman proudly cautioned me. Bakna casually waved the subject and asked about our missing car instead. Y'all don't know who stole our car, do you? He slightly asked Hitman. Nah, man, it wasn't any of us. We got our own cars, Hitman pointed, said pointing three station wagons parked on the side street. I think it was them fools from Lincoln Park, Woodlock said to me as the Pyrus began to disperse. Cuz, who are the La Senna Bangsters? I asked Woodlock. I ain't sure, I think it's the street in, in Lincoln Park, he said. Well, it's spray painted all over the sidewalk there, I said, pointing to the graffiti. Lately, Lincoln Park had began to come out more. I found it strange that all of this was happening around the same time. A new blood gang in Skyline plus Lincoln Park becoming considerably more active? Hey, you guys, here comes Big Ken. That's our ride. As Big Ken pulled up blasting music, everyone piled in to go back to the hood and tell our other homeboys of the encounter we had with the new gang that called themselves the Skyline Pyru. Within a few months, Skyline Piru was a major street gang, and we became rivals immediately. Gunplay increased, and drive-by shootings became routine between the neighborhood Crips and the Skyline Pyrus. A fierce gun battle took place between the two groups one night in front of St. Rita's Catholic Church off Euclid and Imperial Avenue, making local news headlines. Just weeks before the St. Lorita shootout, the Skyline Pyrus became known with law enforcement by holding up a local North Park gun store pawn shop. In this robbery, the Pyrus escaped with an arsenal of weapons. Arrests were made, yet very few weapons were ever recovered. 
It would be safe to say that these weapons were responsible for the increasing use of firearms between the black San Diego gangs who were previously known and respected by fighting skills only. Once firearms became a factor, the neighborhood Crips and Skyline Piru became rivals as a matter of convenience. Besides being natural Crip blood enemies, we were also the closest gang to them geographically. The most important parts of a drive-by shooting is being able to get back to your territory as soon as possible. You should be home or awfully close before police get a call and start rolling. Otherwise, you may cross paths with them on your way back. Because of this, the closest rival gang, Turf, is always your best bet to hit. Most rivals are neighbors. All these incidents that I speak on concerning the Skyline Pyru took place during the year of 1979. However, the following year, the Lincoln Park gang began, py became Pyru also and immediately formed a truce with Skyline. The Blood Gang truce is what led the neighborhood and West Coast Crips to truce as well. Finally becoming allies and ending a long-standing heated rivalry after years of fierce competition. The Skyline Lincoln Truce was ultimately broken, leading to an ongoing major rivalry. However, despite some tense times, the neighborhood and West Coast Crips Truce still stands. The O'Farrell Park Boys, 1975. The O'Farrell Park Boys were a relatively small gang located in the surrounding area of O'Farrell Junior High School. The park that they reference in their gang title is a small park across the street from the school. I recall that park being renewed and named Martin Luther King Jr. Park, but most gangs name their park after the street it sits on or whatever school is closest. Numbers wise, the O'Farrell Park boys never grew past the first core group of guys who started the gang. One of the most known members was a guy named Billy Bad, a small, controversial character who stayed in enough shit to establish his own name. But not enough to add credence to the O'Farrell Park Boys as a group. When I attended O'Farrell, I had a friend that I skipped classes with whose older brother was one of the founders. In closing, the O'Farrell Park Boys was something that I saw spray painted on the walls more than in actual flesh. Today, they have reconstructed into a more competitive force. Their identity is now Bloods, but back in the day, their identity was neutral, as was the case of most older San Diego gangs. O'Farrell Park is definitely one of the original black San Diego gangs, but not as Bloods, because many San Diego gangs did not have Crip or Blood identities until the early to mid 70s. The Central Park City Gangsters, 1972. The Central Park City Gangsters, was a gang before my time, meaning they were operating before I became a gang member. As a kid, I would see their name spray painted on the outside wall of a small apartment complex across the street from the notorious Ocean View Park on Ocean View Boulevard. I thought that they were the toughest street gang in the city because their name sounded hardcore. The Central City Gangsters. The original Central City Gangsters were not Crips nor Bloods. They transitioned into the Five Nine Brims Blood Gang due to the influx of Country, a known Los Angeles Brim who's moved to San Diego in 1974 after his younger brother was killed there by the Crips. By late 1975, the Central City Gangsters had transitioned into the Five Nine Brims. The West Coast Crips, 1972. The neighborhood Crips motto was, if you ain't from the hood, you ain't no good. The West Coast Crips motto was, the West Coast got the most. And it appeared to be true. Sometime West Coast would make showing so large that we would be trying to account for each of them as being actual members. At times we joked that they had tag alongs for intimidation purposes. The West Coast Crips were the first out of both Crips and Bloods to activate in San Diego. Crazy Cat, a known OG, told me at Pelican Bay Prison that San Diego West Coast existed in 1972. The West Coast Crips had never changed their name or stance. However, they boasted several factions such as West Coast Businessmen, West Coast Wrecking Crew, West Coast LTD. They also had the West Coast 20s and 30s, 
The West Coast Rolling Twenties are all the Crips who lived in the 20th to 29th Street blocks, as the Rolling Thirties controlled the 30s blocks. These 20s and 30s blocks are generally located between Market Street and Imperial Avenue. West Coast Crip territory, also known as Logan Heights, holds historical significance because it has always been the original black community of San Diego. I remember in the early 1970s when San Diego's first black-owned funeral home, Anderson Ragsdale Mortuary, was located on 26th and Imperial Avenue. The Nation of Islam Mosque, number eight, was across the street from the funeral home, and the original Black Panthers Party headquarters was located on 29th and Imperial. There were also several restaurants, dry cleaners, and mom and pop shops throughout the West Coast and neighborhood Crips area. The West Coast and neighborhood Crips were the two major black street gangs. Because of this, they were always battling one another for the top slot in the gang world. These were arch rivals with very few peaceful interactions when the two crossed paths. Sometimes gangs gave passes to rivals who might be caught outside of their territory. They would allow them to carry on without incident. But this was never the case between the West Coast and neighborhood. Victories and defeats seesawed between the two and everyone got caught slipping at one time or another. In this generation that I speak on, gang members didn't have cars as much as they do now. Most of us walked or rode the local bus, so chances of getting caught slipping were greater than they are now. The most common slip up is when guys visited girls who lived in rival territories. Going to see the girl you're focused on one thing only so the dangers of being caught slipping don't register as much as it does when you're leaving. In one noted case, 10 West Coast Crips were convicted for manslaughter in the death of a known blood who was beaten after being caught leaving the house of a girl he was involved with. The West Coast Crips had lots of notables in the gang world. Individually, each of them had their 15 minutes of fame. During this time, some of the top name OGs from the West Coast Crips were Big Monk, Mad Five, Dirty Dan, Big Jinx, Crazy Cat, Smiling Al, Goldie, EC, Fat Pat, Ajax, Ruru, Crazy Crip, Godfather, Wacky Corn, Crazy C, 4-5, Cheney, Ace, White Mike, T-Roll, Sittin' Bull, The P-Lards, The Thomases, Squirrel, Finny Boy, Kangaroo, Day Day, Poochie, The Knights, Mad Ass Chris, Lonnie, Reg Dog, The Hayes Family, 8-Ball, The Ivories, Richie Rich, Trey Trey, Killer Shark, Dookie Stick, Rick James, Jesse James, The Woods, Big Money, Top Cat, Bay Turtle, Lil Norm, Antique, and Killer Kent. Ultimately, my final take on the West Coast Crips is that they were a large and notorious group, aggressive and daring. At times, just a few of them might stand up to a group of rivals without biting their tongue. The influence of their role models was so strong that they all seemed to carry themselves in the same manner. <laughs>